Hello everyone. This is chapter 24 of Mary Stewart's Thorny Hold. In the previous chapter, initially, we see Galis kind of wafting about on this cloud of dreams in love with the fact of love, in love with the fact that someone likes her, someone she likes back and that it is Christopher John and all of the things that we would see in the initial development of love which is the need to see them to need to think about them and the urge to visit places where he might be so you might have a chance encounter things that we have done in our own younger days or perhaps we still do we see her doing all of that and then comes the turning point where she actually spies him from a corner and sees that quite opposite to what she had supposed, he doesn't seem to be at all excited about meeting her. In fact, on seeing the signs of her being around, he does the exact opposite and leaves as fast as he can. And that brings a crushing blow to Galus, and that is exactly where this chapter starts. And everything that we know about her from her childhood, from how she has grown up, what her school years have been like, what her relationship with her parents, her mother, her aunt Galus, her pets or pet, everything comes right back up to the surface. Everyone has things that they are insecure about that that can hurt them very deeply. And we see all of that come up to the surface. This whole disbelief that something that which she had started to think was so true, was real, was something she could build on and hope for more in the future comes crashing down at just one incident and she starts questioning everything that she had thought for the past day or so, every feeling that she had felt for the past day or so. And Mary Stewart has depicted that beautifully through her descriptions. It brings back memories of all heartbreaks that all of us have felt, whether we were teenagers or Even now, I think heartbreak always follows the same things. It's almost like a five stages of grief kind of transition. And we definitely see Galis go through that and come out to still be confident in the fact that if this is this be it, then that is so and she shall move on and We see her almost putting up a brave face to face life, regardless of what happens with this. So with that, there is also, I think, one of the biggest build-ups that we probably knew was coming up. The occurrence after the build-up happens finally in this chapter. And it is in the most innocuous of settings I would say considering it is two wise women in a way facing off against each other but the greatest thing about it is nobody is painted dark or light they are just human beings they have felt certain way and they did certain things and it falls all within the gamut of human emotions that is where probably the best blend of magic and reality comes in. So with that, let's get started with the chapter. Thorny Hold by Mary Stewart, Chapter 24 Now, of course, I could not possibly stop at Boscoville. But when I passed the gate and allowed myself a swift look sideways, I could see no sign of his car. I did catch a glimpse of a woman, whom I took to be Mrs. Yelland, 
carrying a box into the house, and there was a sack, perhaps of grain, standing where it had been dumped on the doorstep. He must have brought supplies from the farm and then driven straight on. If he had parked his car at the back of the house, he would surely have left the goods there, or carried them in himself. No, it looked very much as if he had dumped the packages and made his escape, in case I might call on my way back from the farm. He needn't have bothered, I thought drearily, as my bicycle bumped off the track and turned into the side road. Once he had made it obvious that he wanted to avoid me, I would be the last person to go near him, even to ask why. In any case, Mrs. Yellen's presence would make it even more impossible for me to stop and ask him what the matter was. Even when half a mile later I realized that he could not have known that I had seen him take that avoiding action at the farm gate, I simply concluded that he had taken the same action at Boscobel in case I should call on my way home. All the old fears and uncertainties came crowding back to settle dark and formless, like a weeping cloud. How had I ever dreamed that my love could be returned, that someone like him would ever look my way? What had I said, done, that could have so annoyed, no, disgusted him, that he would not risk meeting me? My eyes stung, and I lowered my head and pumped away at the pedals as I made myself go back mentally over yesterday, the peaceful and lovely day, when I had thought, been certain that he loved me. Had the strength of my own feelings deceived me? Scared him? But he had said, had looked. No, forget that, Galus. He had been charming and friendly and kind, and I had forgotten to be shy. Perhaps because he had spoken at some length about William and then about his dead wife, I had read too much into that kindness, so forget it. He had been kind, that was all, to William's friend and lonely neighbour. It came to me like the final shameful stab of self-betrayal that he must be used to the effect he had on women. He had seen it working on me and had decided to draw back. And so must I. The next move must come from him, and if it did not come, then it did not come. The decision, inevitable as it was, came on a flash of pride that steadied my miserably churning thoughts and brought me back to something near common sense. At the same moment, I became aware for the first time since I had left the Boscobel track of where I was. I had sailed downhill past the thorny hold gates without even seeing them, and there at the hill's foot was the river Arne and the bridge where Christopher John and I had sat yesterday when all was happiness and the sun was shining. Well, it was shining today too. I dismounted at the bridge, took my packet of sandwiches and fruit out of the bicycle basket, and, still sustained by that stiffening pride, sat down in the same place on the parapet to eat my lunch. I suppose, being lovesick, I should have left most of the food, but I was hungry and enjoyed it. And the warmth and the beauty of the autumn trees and the flowers in the hedgerow where I had hunted for them yesterday. There was more wild arum growing in the grass beside the crumbling gateposts of the old abbey. The spike I had picked yesterday had been spoiled when I dropped the flowers in the car, so when I had finished eating, 
I wheeled the machine the few yards to the gateway, picked the wild arum and dropped it into the basket with the empty lunch packet and returned for home. This was the time for that fresh start that I had promised myself. I would get out my painting tools and begin this very afternoon. But then I hesitated. Less than ever after this morning's distress did I want to tackle Agnes. She was quite capable of hurrying up to Thornyhold as soon as she saw me pass the lodge. I would keep away until I felt more able to face her. I propped my bicycle by the gateway and went in through the high hedges to the field where the ruins stood. As Mr. Hanneker had said, there was nothing much to see. This was not a national monument, with shaved turf carpeting the noble nave and carefully pointed pillars lining aisles open to the sky. St. Thorn had been a small foundation, but the remains of the church showed spacious lines with one pointed arch still intact framing the sky. Nothing was left of the abbey buildings except, outlined here and there in the grass, the bases of the old walls, long since plundered for their stones by the local builders and farmers. The bigger stones from doorways and pillars and from graves too, by the look of them, had been cleared more recently and set back against the hedges, presumably to make the place into pasture. That cows were pastured here was very obvious. I picked my way into the remains of the church. Nettles grew everywhere, and the grass was long and rank in the shadows, but the centre was grazed clear. Where the worst of the debris of fallen masonry had been shoveled aside to make way for the cattle. It was very quiet. No cattle were about, and no birds sang. I stood in the sunlit nave and looked about me. Towering above me, with the fragments of its tracery still clinging, was the arch that could be seen from the road. The only other remains of any size were the two massive jams of the west door, and lesser columns to either side, where the north and south doors had opened on cloister and garth. Some of the pillars that had lined the aisle still stood, but most were reduced to grass-grown stumps. Nothing else except, near the west end, a flat slab of stone, what my father would have called a resurrection defile, that must once have marked an important grave, all meaningless now, deserted, sad. Beyond the broken stones stretched the empty field. Even the sunlight could bring nothing back. It was a place of darkness. It was indeed. I recognized it now. It was not the same, of course, but it could have been the setting of my dream. The standing stones of cleared graves and broken pillars, the empty sky beyond the uprights of the west door, the flat stone half hidden in the grass, the feeling of desolation. Well, Miss Ramsay, fancy seeing you here. I spun around. Agnes Trapp leaned her bicycle against the gate post opposite mine and came towards me, smiling. The sight of her banished all other preoccupations from my mind. So powerfully had I already gone in imagination through the interview I had planned with her that I half expected her to tackle me with it straight away. But all she said was, You come in to look at the old place then? Pretty, isn't it? Yes. Actually, I came to get some flowers and things. That yellow one growing on the wall is quite rare. Flowers? Haven't you plenty in the garden, then? Wild ones. I want to draw them. I used to do quite a bit of flower painting. I thought I'd like to start again, Agnes. Yes? She had been looking about her as we talked and now turned back to me with a kind of smiling 
complacency that made me wonder. Suddenly, as if she was here by chance, or if the jungle drums, Jessamy, or the widow Margaret had set her looking for me, to find me here on her own ground. I took a deep breath, and with it, a fast hold on my courage. This was certainly not the place I would have chosen, but something told me it was now or never. I left the shadowy precinct of the church and walked over to where, in sunlight, lay a log. No old unhallowed stone, just a fallen tree, clean and dead. I was hoping to see you today. My voice sounded calm and pleasant. I called at your house, but Jesme told me you'd gone into town. I wanted to tell you that I found the book. You did? She looked pleased, more than pleased. She sparkled. There was something about her this morning, a shine of pleasure, almost of gaiety, and with it something of that force I had seen in her before. Well, I had not chosen my ground as I would have wished, but this would have to do. I sat down on the fallen log. Yes, I was right about it. My cousin had given it to someone for safekeeping because, as we thought, it is actually rather valuable. So you'll understand that I'd rather not let it out of the house, at any rate, till I've let some expert or other take a look at it. But she told me I could have it. She... I know. Let me finish. It's there at home. And if you want to, you can come up and look at it and copy out anything you want. One thing, though. What's that? Quick, almost defensive. There isn't a recipe for bramble jelly in the book. You've been through it all, then? Sharply. Not really. I just glanced through for that one because you told me it was special. It's definitely not there. I saw the spark of laughter jump to her eyes. She sat down beside me on the tree trunk a yard or so away. Oh, well, there. I must have seen it somewhere else. But there's others I remember I'd be glad to have. Then that's all right. I smoothed a hand along the stripped tree trunk. The feel of the warm wood was real and somehow reassuring. Any time, just let me know. Today? After supper? If you like. I'm going home soon. A pause. I saw her eyeing me with some curiosity, but I thought, totally without suspicion or enmity. Did you only come here after the flowers? She asked. It was my opening. Yes. And to look at the old church, but now that I've seen it, I'm a bit puzzled. I feel as if I'd been here before, but I know that's not true. A smile broadened and she gave a nod of satisfaction. I thought you'd feel that way. Why? Agnes, why did you drug me that night, when you left the pie for my supper? If she was startled, it was... For no more than a second, then she nodded again triumphantly. I knew it! As soon as I laid my eyes on you, I said to the others, She's all right, I said. She's likely. She'll be one of us, give her time. And I was right. There was no fool in you, was there? You knew straight away? Not straight away, but soon enough. What was in the pie? Nothing to harm, nothing to harm. Just to let you know we were here. And you were welcome. I was silent for a moment. So that's what it's all been about. You did say once that you'd like to take me along to your meetings. I gather that they're held here. She was looking at me with a new expression in which I thought I could see a touch of awe. Do you tell me that you saw this? She waved a hand. These? That first time? Without even getting out of your bed? 
something very like this place, I added slowly. And one or two people I'd know again. Then you have got the power? You got it already? You're one of us, Miss Galis Ramsey? No, I'm not. You drugged me and I had a dream and it was something like this churchyard. That's all. That was what I started to say, but as if that gentle hand had stopped my lips again, I paused and said instead, My cousin was here too, Miss Saxon. She helped me to leave. And next morning, a pigeon came in with a message from her, wishing me well. The ground was mine now. She went white. But that, that cannot be true, miss. It cannot. She wasn't here. She's dead. So? She never was here. She never would come. She took a gulp of air. And like I told you, the pigeons all went over Eddie Masson's way. So? I said again. Whether or not I had what Agnes called the power, such power as I had found, I would exploit while I could. You're not suggesting that Mr. Masson sent me the message. I'll show it to you. When you come to Thornyhold this evening, you know Miss Saxon's writing, I suppose. I settled myself more comfortably on the log. Tell me this, please. When I woke first after that drugged dream, I thought that you and Jessamy were in my bedroom, and I found later that you could have got into the house by the scullery window. Well? She was looking down at the grass at her feet. She nodded. We didn't do no harm. Jessamy got in that little window and let me in. We came to see if you was all right after the medicine, that's all. You don't always know the first time. Grand. Yes, it fitted. And to shut the window up? Ah, that was you. A nod. You went flying, am I right? I said nothing, but she took it for an answer. Well, to stop it, you really go in through the window? There's some as do. No great shakes as a witch. Poor Gran with her overdose, it seemed I had been lucky. I kept my voice level and hard. Did you look through the house while I was asleep? Nay, what was the use? I'd looked already. She hesitated, and the blue eyes came up guileless. I won't say I didn't look for the key, but I couldn't find it. The still room key? I? And the soup, which I may tell you I didn't drink. You didn't drink that? She said it, I thought, admiringly. How did you know not to drink that? Then with a spark of her old self. Did another bird come and tell you? I laughed and then that disconcerted her. No, not that night. Not to give Jessamy away. I moved back on to half-truths. I was awake when that dog cried out and I saw Jessamy running past the house. Did the dog bite him? I wouldn't take the food, but broke its rope and bit him. Don't bother, Agnes. This time I let the anger show. I know what happened. Do you think I can't see? I went to the big house in the morning and found where you'd kept the dog, and I called it to me and it came. That dog? Came? To you? And it will stay with me. Where did you get it? It was train? Gypsies, likely? She sounded surly and subdued, and I had no reason to doubt her. Would I got shot otherwise? A collie strain in Sheepland? Well, it's mine now, so you let it alone. I won't ask what you were doing with it, because I know that too, but... You'll not touch it again. Neither you nor Jessamy. Understand? Another nod. She shuffled her feet in the grass. Was Jessamy badly bitten? Dog bites can be dangerous. Not bad. And I put the bruise word on, and the salve your auntie made. 
Was that the recipe that you wanted from Lady Sybil's book? I look upward at that, slanted and sly. I saw a dimple and the pretty mouth pursed, as if to stop a smile. No, miss. Then what? There's one for a cordial from the plums, and I saw some for sweets that your auntie used to make for Gran. She has a real sweet tooth for sweets. Unguarded, the syllable was totally disbelieving. She flashed me a look, then smiled, and dipping into the pocket of her coat, brought out a small round box of wood shavings, the sort that used to hold Turkish delight at Christmas time. She opened it. Inside, nestling in a white lace paper doily, were small squares of fudge. I make a lot, said Agnes. Not just for mother, for all the sales. Try some. "'Tis my own recipe, this one, and got a prize last time. I put it into Arnside show. "'Help yourself, miss. Do. "'Try some. "'Try tackling a known witch on her own ground, and end up sitting with her on a log, eating homemade fudge. "'Try not eating it.' "'I looked at the box, then helplessly at Agnes. "'Thanks. But I don't really... I mean, it looks lovely, but I don't care terribly for sweets. She laughed merrily. <laughs> so you think it's got something in it that'll set you flying again? Nay, nay, there's nothing here to look. I'll eat it myself to show you. She took a piece, popped it into her mouth, crunched, chewed and swallowed. There! She got to her feet and stood in front of me. All at once solemn. Miss Ramsay, if I done wrong, I'm sorry. We all have our own ways. And I thought the world of your auntie. But I knew we all knew that she would never come along with us here. All right, but tis no manner of harm we do, just a little fun. And a few secrets and something to look forward to come the right times. Well, I thought when I saw you, she might be different, I thought, and she's likely, so I gave it a try. Nothing to hurt nor harm. Never hurt nor harmed yet, except my own mother. And you wouldn't call that harm if you'd a known her before. Agnes. No, let it be a minute. I've not done yet. She nodded, still solemn, and went on. All right, so maybe you don't like what Jess did to the dog. But you know he's not clever and he's no... He knows no better. Would you really have drowned Hodge? She stopped, disconcerted. Drowned Hodge? Did you try? You couldn't have done it in the well. Not after that bird fell in and she put the grating over. But what did you do to make him hate you so? There now, you see? It was triumph. You knew that too, but you're wrong about Hodge. He was her cat, and a cat's tricky to mell with. I never did nothing to Hodge. He went, that's all, after she went. Oh, Miss Galis, Miss Galis, won't you come with me? Just the once and see. No, I won't. Whatever I know or have is going to stay right inside Phony Hold, and my animals are staying there with me and nothing of the other sort is to come near us again. There was a silence. While we measured one another, eye to eye, my heart was thumping and my hand, flat on the tree trunk, was damp. But it was Agnes's gaze that fell. Well, she said at length, on a long breath, as if relinquishing something, you mean it? I see that. All right, I promise. Neither hurt nor harm, not you and yours. She took another piece of sweet and held out the box again. So take a piece, miss, and we'll say no more, except that I'm main sorry if there's been any upset. What could I do? She was already swallowing. I took a piece of the fudge and put it in my mouth. It was coffee-flavoured and very good. I stood up. Well, 
I'll get home now, I think. I, I'm glad we've had this talk, Agnes, and got things straight. I'll expect you this evening, shall I? Are you going back now? No, said Agnes. She was standing very straight. The sparkle was a glitter. Her eyes were brilliant, her face rosy. She looked very pretty. I'm off to Tag's farm. Bosco Bell, he calls it. I left some of the sweets there yesterday while you and he was out sweethearting, and now I'm going over to see them working. I stared at her. The barely swallowed sweet stuff made me feel sick. What are you talking about? It was a frightened croak. Some of her wretched drugs, sweet, see them working. Then sweets, he doesn't eat them. He'll give them to William. Too violent, half the dose for a child. What have you done? Nothing you won't get over, but it's my turn now. I was going to wait till I'd seen the one in her book, the love drink. But after yesterday and the way he looked at you, I wasn't waiting any more. And that drink wasn't the only one I knew. So I made the sweets and took them over. And the minute he lays eyes on me, Miss Galis Ramsey, it's me he'll want, me. And don't you think he'll ever have cause to regret it, neither? She shoved the box of sweets back in her pocket and laughed in my face. I said nothing. I must have been staring at her mouth open like an idiot, but it was not distress that struck me dumb. She was still talking, flushed and exultant, but I did not hear a word of it. What she had told me was crazy, it was shocking, but the very shock tore clean through the whirling clouds of the morning's misery and blew them to shreds. My thoughts settled clear and still. Christopher John. If Agnes was telling the truth, and I thought she was, then nothing I had said or done had alienated or alarmed him. In the sane and daylight world, he loved me and had made it plain. All that had happened this morning was that he had succumbed to some filthy drug of Agnes's concocting, and I knew from my own experience what effect her efforts could have. So if she had something of witchcraft at her fingertips, then how much more could I, Galus of Thorny hold? I stopped short. That way, no, I didn't meet the sudden chill of a cloud across the sun, as tangible as that touch from the air to turn me back from something that I, and Cousin Galus with her greater powers, had rejected. But the new self-confidence remained. In the sane and daylight world, my own phrase came back to me. It was still that. He and I belonged there, not to the sad and silly world of drugs and nightmare dreams. And in the real world, he loved me. He was highly intelligent and articulate. He knew about Agnes. Surely. Then all I had to do was tell him all that had happened, and we could talk it out. Her voice rose, shrill and triumphant. Yes, you may well stand there, my lady. So you won't join in with us? Oh, no. Then you can just stay outside and see what we can do when we want to. And now I'll be on my way. Agnes, are you out of your mind? Agnes, no, wait, listen. I was shouting at the air. She was already through the gateway, had grabbed her bicycle and mounted. By the time I reached the gateway, she was fifty yards away, pedalling furiously. The dappled shadows swallowed her pounding form and she was gone. I seized my own machine and yanked it out onto the metal. I swear I had no thought of beating her to the encounter. The fairy tale meeting that her shaky magic had planned, it was William I was afraid for. With the image of Gran, the echo of Christopher John, no great shakes as a witch. But she was pretty competent with a bicycle. As I whirled my round, 